welcome everyone to the History of Gardens and Landscape Seminar uh, at the Institute of Historical Research. I'm Michael Ann Mullen, one of the conveners. Uh, we're glad to see you here today. I wanted to make an apology in the first instance. Uh, I wanted to apologize that you didn't receive, those of you who wanted it or expected it, a link to the recording of the last seminar, Imperial Collections, Palaces, Plants, and Politics, which was given by Joanna Mershner. Normally a link uh, to the recording goes out the day after the, the seminar and is active for a week. It's on Zoom. And by the time that week lapses, it's up on the, uh, the Institute of Historical Research um, uh, YouTube. H however, this time, time, both of the links failed to arrive. So we haven't got, managed to get it up anywhere. And for those who are expecting it, I'm very sorry. It will be posted uh, as soon as it's through, um, which should be by tomorrow. So maybe you'll get a link for this talk and for that one tomorrow at the same time. Anyway, this shouldn't happen again. Uh, now I'd like to just um, do my regular reminders. Please mute your computers and turn off your uh, video now. Uh, you can turn the video back on for the questions. It'd be nice to see you then. Uh, and for the questions, per usual, please type your questions into the chat box and uh, Pippa will um, re relay them to Rada, our speaker. Uh, I'd like to tell you that the live transcript function has been enabled because we've been asked for our speaker, our, our attendees with uh, comp compromised hearing to activate that. Uh, if it shows on your screen and you don't like it, you can go down to where it says right on the right there, it'll say, it says live transcript. And if you hit live transcript, you can disable it for your particular computer. So you don't actually have to have it up, but those who want it can have it. Now I'd like to hand over to Pippa Potts, another of the conveners, to uh, introduce our speaker. Pippa? Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, our speaker this evening is Dr. Rado Dalal. Um, Rada taught art history and Asian studies at the College of Charleston before moving to the Virginia Commonwealth University in Doha, Qatar, where she's now Assistant Professor of Islamic Art and Architecture, as well as being Director of Art History. She's also currently the Vice President of the Society for Global 19th Century Studies, which brings together a diverse network of scholars interested in the world's connectedness between 1780 and 1914. Aside from other published work, she recently co-edited a volume entitled The Seas and the Mobility of Islamic Art. So I think we are getting a strong sense of her interest in the way, ways ideas about art, including of garden art, have been crossing continents for centuries. Her paper this evening looks at one very specific example, namely the translation of a concept of an Ottoman garden in an American setting. It's been described not just as the first garden of its kind in the USA, but also as the only known public Ottoman garden in the world. And Rada will explore just how this reinterpretation of the Ottoman garden has worked across both time and space. So please let me welcome her on your behalf. Rada, we're delighted that you could be with us this evening and really look forward to hearing about the Bakewell Ottoman garden in St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pippa, and thank you, Michael Ann. Um, that was a very warm welcome. Um, and thank you, everybody uh, who is participating today. Um, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background uh, before I begin, I um, came to know about this garden a few years ago, maybe about five uh, years or so ago, and um, had the opportunity to visit it then. And so some of what um, I'm going to be talking about today comes from personal experience, but also in relation to um, the uh, history of the garden itself and its connection to its Ottoman roots. Um, and yeah, so without further ado, I shall go ahead and begin. To see a garden and not be able to recognize its background or catch its figures of speech as it tells us its history is like being at a party full of strangers with no one introducing guests to each other. 
These are the words of Anne Leighton, historian of American landscape architecture, who found value in unearthing the full spectrum of meanings of American public gardens, which are often an amalgamation of native and foreign botanical, architectural, ornamental, and cultural elements. Similarly, Didi Fairchild Ruggles, historian of Islamic architecture on adoption of Islamic garden culture by non-Islamic institutions contends, quote, if form and meaning are not inextricably bound to each other, then one of the historian's tasks must be to explore the meaning of a particular form in each of its historical moments and places, end quote. And she's specifically referring to an example that you see on the screen, uh, Shangri-La at, um, uh, in Honolulu in Hawaii, which is uh, part of the Doris Duke Foundation. And I'll return to this a little bit later in the paper. In examining the Bakewell Ottoman Garden, a 2006 addition to the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis, Missouri, my interest today is to catch its figures of speech for the gardening customs and spaces it aims to display have a complex history. One can simply choose to read the Bakewell Garden as an exotic rendering, a reincarnation of a unique horticultural tradition, or a model reinterpretation of an Ottoman cultivated landscape, a simulacrum to put it another way. But it is promoted as not just the first garden of its kind in the United States, but as the only known public Ottoman garden in the world. Since its architectural design and bot botanical taxonomy is rooted in the rich gardening legacy of the Ottoman Empire, and since its mission is to educate the American public on Ottoman culture beyond the plant specimens it nurtures, how may we best approach the notion of public in this context? In other words, how do we understand the adoption of form disconnected from its attendant cultural meanings and social practices conceived, developed, and perfected in a foreign locale? In light of its setting as part of an American botanical garden, I argue that the Bakewell version is a translation at the intersection of cultural modalities in the Ottoman Empire and the United States, vis-a-vis -vis the emergence of circumscribed public spaces. I consider the ways in which educational and recreational activities, private and public designations, and gender-specific access inflect the intended consumption practices of Ottoman and American gardens, my examination will thus necessarily oscillate between the historical and the contemporary. Any exploration of the ambiguities of public space in this comparative analysis must begin with the acknowledgement of an obvious incongruence. Botanical gardens simply did not exist in the Ottoman Empire in the same way they were established in Europe and America. This is not to say keen art interest in Arboriculture, floriculture, pomology, and other aspects of horticulture was lacking in the Ottoman realm. On the contrary, Ottoman gardeners and botanists steeped in their craft, reared all kinds of trees and plants, engaged in experimentation with crossbreeding, and were in general well-respected globally for their horticultural knowledge. On a more quotidian level, nearly every Ottoman home had a small planted garden, grew fruit bearing trees and vegetables, or window boxes full of scented blooms. The full-scale practice of horticulture, however, remained primarily within the purview of the imperial gardeners, overseeing large-scale palace, mosque complex, and public projects, and of the nobility whose mansion annexes held private plots for cultivation. Commercial enterprises and the sale of exotic plant species also existed. Indeed, Ottoman cultivators were astutely aware of the economic value of such trades, and the tulip flower underscores this mindset best. And you can see the tulips are still blooming to this day um, in Istanbul and elsewhere in Turkey. This attentiveness, however, did not rise to the somewhat lofty ideal increasingly upheld by transatlantic horticulturists and botanists of educating the public in the workings of nature. Botanical gardens in Europe and America evolved from an interest in taxonomic, uh, taxonomic classification of medicinal species to the collection, conservation, and display of all native and foreign plant life. And this is um, one of the sections of the Missouri Botanical Garden. It's the Linnaean house, of course, named after Carl, Carl Linnaeus. Um, and you can see on the right side, it's part of their collection. Uh, it's an unpublished manuscript still, uh, but it's the Lapland journey from 1732 that has some of the sketches um, related to the 
uh, flora of the, uh, of the region. Beginning in the 18th century, especially in Europe, the functions of the botanical gardens often shifted in alliance with the economic imperatives of expanding empires, colonial taming of geographies abroad, leading to the retrieval of new species, accompanied the intellectual domination over the natural at home under the veil of pure scientific advancement. In the grander narrative of gardening history, botanical gardens formed part of a wider concern with creating a landscape which conformed to disciplined aesthetic conditions. In addition, their remit included civic education, whereby the public audience would receive instruction to take note of, appreciate, and foster understanding of the careful and tasteful taxonomic arrangements. In early 19th century America, the scientific, edifying, and visually appealing were intertwined together in the service of propagating a potent national statement on the exemplary values of a democracy. Botanical gardens were charged with generating a vision and inculcating a belief that the new nation was self-sufficient, prosperous, and expanding westward into uncharted lands. In the 1840s and 1850s, the opening of botanical gardens rose to near fever pitch, and the Missouri Botanical Garden was established toward the tail end of this period in 1859. Despite the 150 year lag between its founding and that of the Bakewell Garden in 2006, the latter's mission is firmly nested within the overall civic role of educating the citizenry, a point I come back to later. The garden is an eponymous benefaction of St. Louis's Bakewell family. Edward L. Edward L. Bakewell Jr. bequeathed part of his wealth toward the creation of a public garden within the precincts of the Missouri Botanical Garden and thereby under its direct governance. The Ottoman-inspired outcome of this bequest is an enterprise driven by his two sons, who recall their father's interest in Turkish history, as well as personal family lore traced to an Ottoman queen. Legend connects the Bakewell maternal lineage to an 18th century French noblewoman who was captured by pirates on a voyage from the Caribbean to France and sold to the Ottoman court. She is the alleged mother of Sultan Mehmed II and cousin to Empress Josephine of France. Against this colorful romantic backdrop, the garden offers a pleasant interlude into the world of Ottoman imperial pleasure, where the boundaries between private and public are highly blended. Situated in the northeastern corner of the botanical garden next to the Linnaean house, the Ottoman garden forms a quarter acre enclave unto itself. Its northern end abuts a parking lot, while the eastern facade is alongside a busy roadway. Secluded behind a tall walled enclosure, as well as a hedgerow, the garden is visually inaccessible save for a few latticed windows and a wrought iron fence offering tantalizing glimpses of interior delights. Travel accounts on the Ottoman Empire consistently indicate fan fascination with private spaces. As late as 1915, H.T. Dwight, an American journalist in Istanbul, noted the abundance of gardens in the city only visible, quote, through open gateways and over tops of walls, rendering them mysterious to curious eyes. Thus the walled element of the Bakewell Garden adheres to Ottoman preferences for privacy derived from Islamic prohibitions on unwanted visual intrusion into private areas. The invitation to enter and savor then is akin to the 18th century phenomenon where the Ottoman public was beginning to enjoy unprecedented access to unused palatial gardens specifically opened for leisure and amusement. The revivification of an Ottoman gardening genre in the Bakewell context includes a combination of features referencing horticultural, decorative, and fluvial elements. Beyond a large red entrance gate, brick and stone paths lead the visitor into the lush and heavily perfumed sanctum. Immediately within the garden and straight ahead from the main gate is a beautiful marble sundial configured to indicate Islamic prayer times. So I'll just go back one slide to show you. So if you're entering, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I hope you can. If you're entering through this gate, you'll notice that there is the sundial right there. And then um, you can see the uh, fountain uh, behind it. And so now we're looking at it from the sundial. So we're kind of right inside the entrance of the, of the garden. 
Right behind the sundial and in the center of the entire space is a large sunken octagonal pool containing a marble fountain, one of the many sources of water inside this garden, hearkening back to the Ottoman love for bodies of fresh flowing water, as well as the allusion to the rivers of paradise in Islam. On the far side, a raised wooden pergola recalls sumptuous kiosks punctuating imperial gardens. The tree beds on the outer edges and the flower beds encircling the fountain hint at the rich botanical profusion spanning the geographic breadth and temporal depth of the Ottoman Empire. Boxwoods, lemons, figs, cherry, pomegranate, and jasmine, among others, are interspersed with seasonal varieties like carnations, hollyhock, crocus, and the hyacinths, and of course the tulip. Murals along the back wall, and you can see them right here. Flanked on either side by Ottoman style birdhouses present a visual taxonomy of the floral specimens derived from Ottoman botanical manuscripts, including some in the garden's own collection. And water is sampled from a marble cheshme in one corner. Um, this is the little spigot that you can see there. Uh, and melodically dribbles from the selsabil behind a wooden throne in the bower. And so here's the other one right behind the throne. Shielding the throne from the elements is a dome surmounted with a tulip-shaped alim, right up over there. Its soffit painted in floriated motifs is reminiscent of Ottoman mosques. And so this is the underside of the dome. The perspective from the throne is of, uh, excuse me, of verdant, fragrant, and mellifluous surrounds. One can imagine sitting on the throne, much like a sultan, surveying his private paradise on earth, a microcosm of his sovereign domain. In short, the architectural program of the garden aligns more with imperial notions of private space and its associated rituals than the kind of public gardens prevalent in the Ottoman Empire. The Bakewell Garden is certainly unique in privileging Ottoman aesthetics over the more common Indo-Persian Islamic models favored by personages such as Doric Duke, Doris Duke at her residence and museum, Shangri-La in Hawaii. Yet, unlike its Ottoman ancestors and more in keeping with the Persian and Mughal cousins, the garden cleaves to a stricter geometrical symmetry in its layout. For Eastern Islamic gardens, according to Ruggles, structuring in this manner reflected a powerful metaphor for the organization and domestication of the landscape, itself a symbol of political territory. This in turn leads to a more restricted controlled environment in accordance with regulations of a botanical garden, but inconsistent with the kind of mobility enjoyed in Ottoman public gardens. The Bakewell garden follows an axial plan set within a square enclosure with neatly laid out flower beds, much like in a parterre. This arrangement is in high contrast to classical or Ottoman gardens, where the emphasis remained on the delightfully chaotic as opposed to the ordered, the unconstructed versus the expertly partitioned, and the natural rather than the artificial. In fact, travelers would comment on the seeming lack of artifice in Ottoman landscapes as almost subscribing to the desire for the picturesque in Europe. For example, Dwight, our American journalist again, in his observations of various gardens in Istanbul, was astonished at the absence of an architectural effect. He stated, I always wonder whether the natural look of so many paths and stone stairs and terraces is merely a result of time or whether it is an accident of the kind striven for by a school of our own gardeners. Aside from design, Ottoman gardens embraced a utilitarian aspect quite foreign in Europe and America. Fruits, flowers, produce, and other yields from the gardens would be used in the households of the owners or sold off in a, if in excess, implying concern with efficiency and sustainability. Private Ottoman gardens also adhered to strict protocol in terms of decorum. In the gardens of the Sultan, as well as the wealthier segments of society, members of the court and others would gather to stroll, sing, play musical instruments, picnic, and generally amuse themselves, all within the comfort and privacy offered by high walls. Through its design, the Bakel Ottoman Garden straddles the unstable dichotomy of public and private in this regard. In getting you visually acquainted with the garden and highlighting its selection and placement of Ottoman forms, 
My intent is less to levy criticism on its referential authenticity and more to situate it within a continuum of discourse on the aesthetics, functions, and space of public gardens and foreign domesticated landscapes in America. Gardening design in the United States began by emulating European paradigms. It gradually shifted to consider the topography, climate, and abundant natural flora in the vast reaches of the country. The ultimate result is a rich and complex history of assimilation and innovation. Early adaptation often followed the 18th century British quest for the picturesque, and aesthetic developed on the basis of travel into the English countryside, as well as international excursions, such as the grand tours to France and Italy. Two pioneers of American landscape architecture, Andrew Jackson Downing and Frederick Law Olmsted, championed public parks where the picturesque was further invested with the solemn charge to provide rational entertainment, aesthetic pleasure, and moral grounding. Indeed, in service of the betterment of the general public, Downing and Olmsted advocated public gardens specifically for health benefits because, their ability to provide, because of their ability to provide a restorative atmosphere. Moreover, embracing the spirit of democracy, these parks were intended to elevate the taste and morals of fellow citizens through the effects of nature, education, and culture. These sentiments extended well beyond the conception of public parks to include botanical gardens and world's fairs where patrons and designers vigorously pursued the civic mission through the exhibition of international gardens, pleasingly packaged for domestic consumption. By the beginning of the 20th century, America's strengthening of relationships with nations in the Far East, particularly Japan, motivated a taste for the exotic and whetted the appetites of garden designers who either introduced Japanese features into existing gardens or created isolated displays, thereby accentuating their foreignness. St. Louis was the first American city to receive a fully functional strolling Japanese garden from the Meiji government on occasion of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in 1904. And it's very interesting if you take a closer look at this, um, uh, this image, which is, of course is uh, coming from a stereoscope. Uh, here in the front are the um, architectural elements and sort of the walkways of the Japanese garden. And then curiously right behind it is uh, supposed to be the uh, uh, evocation of Jerusalem uh, with um, a kind of like a mini version of the Dome of the Rock. Um, and so it, again, the juxtaposition doesn't quite make sense, but it's very interesting to see um, how it was uh, brought into the um, exposition this way. In the wake of such installations, Japanese designs took off in America, particularly in favorable climes where Japanese botanical species could flourish. While the American populace thoroughly enjoyed this novel style, Comprehending the multivalent meanings associated with different aspects of Japanese gardens did not translate as well. Conventional modes of engagement with strolling gardens in Japan, which included social rituals, scholarly and philosophical contemplation, and fixed rules of etiquette, were lost in translation, to quote the famous film. But blended designs featuring a diversity of American traditions, along with Japanese elements, made exotic gardens more legible to the public. David Stretfield, historian of landscape architecture, suggested that the construction of Japanese gardens in America reflected fidelity to form, yet hybridity and intellectual assimilation. In stark contrast to their origins, these gardens were adapted for modern American living patterns, which valued nature as a visual amenity and backdrop, rather than as conceptual and philosophical abstraction central to life. This kind of conceptual and intellectual appreciation of a cultivated landscape would not be unusual across the echelons of Ottoman society. Manuscript paintings, prose and poetry ranging from high culture to folk categories and other media extensively chronicle the elevated interaction of Ottoman subjects with their landscapes. Aesthetic traditions emerged and matured both as a result of cultural predispositions toward flora, foliage and vistas as well as religious associations with the sensorial aspects of paradise. Distinct literary and visual genres also articulate the significance of real and imaginary gardens in the legitimation, legitimation of imperial ideology, as well as the evocation of the divine in Islamic eschatology. 
Gardens simultaneously performed as sites of state control, public resistance, spiritual communion, and satisfying recreation. Similar to Japanese gardens of the early 20th century, beyond pleasing and visual cognitive effects, apprehending the myriad virtues and functions of Ottoman gardens in an American setting would be difficult in part because they are no longer living traditions. And what you see here is a, a, a lovely um, sketch, or actually it's a, an etching um, from the 19th century that shows the sweet waters of Asia um, on the um, Bosphorus in Istanbul, and just the local population sort of enjoying this um, park uh, with this um, neo-Baroque style fountain that was um, installed there by one of the um, Valide Sultans, so one of the Sultan's mothers um, in the um, early, uh, late 18th, early 19th century. Large expanses of greenery unfolding into the woodlands surrounding the Ottoman capital afforded folks from all sectors of society a chance to intermingle and to indulge in a refreshing environment. Travelers noted Ottoman citizens' proclivity to stroll in open, fresh air, verdant spaces while feasting the eyes and the senses on the vibrant landscapes, natural sounds, and flowing water. This is, of course, a very, very um, early uh, image of Constantinople. A uh, very famous one, and it's just a detail of the entire um, painting. But you can see, of course, you know the the prominence of these lush green areas in which these um, mansions are then nestled. And so this is kind of what you know was expected in terms of Istanbul's outskirts um, and where the populace the population would go and um, enjoy um, strolls. Oops, sorry. On Fridays and special holidays, gardens would become sites of celebration and merrymaking, where groups of men, women, and entire families would pitch tents, gather to picnic, and enjoy the outdoors. Yet everyday public engagements in Ottoman gardens were decidedly gendered. Foreign visitors routinely remarked on the segregation of the sexes in public gardens. Despite the existence of laws derived from Islamic principles of modesty, the segregation was by no means fixed and applied uniformly across all public spaces. During Ottoman times, Istanbul's urban form included huge natural spaces within the limits of the city and its surrounding environs. In such areas, keeping vigil over male-female interactions was not as easily achievable. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the newfound freedom to stroll about in open spaces with all genders, creeds, ethnicities, and ages present together led to anxiety about the degradation of moral or order. These public spaces reflected shifting urban and social realities of the city, yet always under surveillance and subject to laws governing morality and order. Up through the Tanzimat reforms of the 19th century, restrictions on male-female interactions in public, for example, remained largely in force and appropriate conduct was codified through issuance of legal ordinances and the meeting out of harsh punishments should transgressions occur. Regardless, Pleasure gardens became increasingly accessible to women and allowed them an opportunity to mingle amongst their own sex outside of the homestead. And this was really interesting. Ebru Boyar and Kate Fleet have pointed out that social practices enacted within these gardens stemmed from a desire to be on display, that is, to see and to be seen, something only meaningful outside of the private sphere. Increased appearances in public, particularly of women, were dictated more by social status and wealth rather than religious or ethnic divisions. As Edith Ambrose notes, quote, higher visibility was not necessarily related to frequency of visibility, for one could argue that poor women in crowds formed an invisible mass, but rich women, although out much less often and not in numbers, were more visible for they represented power and wealth and pomp something much more attractive than poverty, end quote. By discussing private versus public gardens in the Ottoman capital, I do not wish to privilege a one-dimensional reading of these spheres as if wholly separate and distinct. Indeed, it would be virtually impossible to categorize spatial manifestations of gender and class divisions beyond a short extent. As Ellen Mikhail, Shirin Hamade, and other scholars have convincingly demonstrated, private and public delineations were often more overlapping and fluid than previously understood. An absolute 
Habermasian binary is therefore invalidated in favor of a more nuanced approach to the fairly, fairly permeable boundaries in domestic and communal spaces. Alongside greater access and visibility, European stylistic imprint and Ottoman sartorial fashions, architectural design, and other arenas of culture increased over time, intertwining with imperial and aristocratic desires to indulge in what Shirin Hamade has called the novel. An example of that is, is on the screen right now, of course, with the Dolma Bace Palace. Um, but why I also had it up was to just show you um, within the um, outskirts of the palace itself, grounds where uh, people are sort of, sort of enjoying, you know, being out in the open and being out in sort of um, the um, uh, untamed landscape, if you will. <clears throat> the influences intensified, intensified in tempo during the 19th century steadily transformed the Ottoman capital's built environment as well as its society. As a result, imperial and public gardens, as much as any other urban sector, were subject to reconfigurations of style in reciprocity to the changing habits of the populace. Public parks in the English and French idiom were highly sought by the Ottoman elite, but especially by the European residents of Istanbul, who had direct experience with such spaces in their home countries. Most public parks in Europe originated from formal royal hunting grounds and evolved from rigid formal schemes to the more informal picturesque ones during the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. Extensive lawns, gently, gently rolling topography, strategically placed bodies of water, and well-maintained but meandering pathways redolent of a romantic countryside bespoke a European lifestyle replete with public spaces for passive pursuits. However, the introduction of such European style par public parks in Istanbul did not occur until the mid 19th century. In 1869, Taksim, which has been in the news quite often in the last decade, received its first public park. Its rectangular plan included a beautifully choreographed central section laid out in the shape of a concentric circle surrounded by rows of trees and walkways gradually giving way to a wilder perimeter. And what you, I, I don't have um, an image of that particular park um, simply because it's changed um, over the last century. Um, but this is what that region looked like before um, the public park was developed. Um, and so you can see, you know, it's a really large space uh, with what, a lot of natural um, greenery there as well. And um, it was already used as a recreational space uh, long before the public park was built. A second park opened a few years later in Tepebashe. Both were primarily utilized by the international residents of Para. Entrance to the parks required an admission fee, thereby excluding a large contingent of the city's population and ensuring the right stratum of society had access. Officials and others lamented the state of affairs since it barred the common populace from ever enjoying the pleasures of a manicured communal green space within the city. Those who sought to improve the social conditions of the poor considered such spaces a necessity for fitness and rejuvenation. In the early 20th century, parks free to all rungs of society opened, chiefly to mitigate health issues amongst the impoverished. Limitations on entry and utilization of public parks uh, and gardens then indicate formal and informal modes of social control. Ottoman public gardens proved to be suitable venues for leisure for different segments of society as long as they respected the rules of engagement in context of gender, class, and overall virtue. These social constraints are significant to our reading of Ottoman culture in an American setting, where in theory, spaces are more democratically oriented but in practice subject to some similar policies. In 19th century America, public parks, including botanical gardens, were perceived as a perfect antidote to the chaos and decay of urban environments. Large landscaped central parks under the influence of Olmsted developed across America, much as in Victorian England, where public parks had inspired Olmsted and others in his profession, Emphasis on fresh air, sunlight, and foliage was linked to reliving tensions, uh, relive, re, relieving tensions, sorry, and pressures of urban living. Public parks were meant to have, in Olmsted's own words, 
a harmonizing and refining influence upon the most unfortunate and most lawless classes of the city, an influence favorable to courtesy, self-control, and temperance." Unquote. Inviting green expanses such as Central Park in New York City, surrounded by dwellings of all strata in society, led to the mingling of the poor, the working class, and the wealthy. But the expected utopian harmony was never fully realized, quite the contrary. Transgressions across the formerly more rigid boundaries between social classes led to controversies over rules of use and ultimately the establishment of codes of public conduct specific to these sites. Public space became a forum for, forum for disciplining the poor to the mores, mores of the gentry. As landscape architect Stephen Carr asserts, quote, by providing services defined by another class and by ignoring the value and the vitality of ethnic recreational habits, the sanitized set of resources shaped rather than reflected the needs of the users, end quote. This form of social control over public spaces and its accompanying ambition to cast a civilizing influence is not too dissimilar in the Ottoman case. Social control was deemed just as necessary and it was meant to school all classes, particularly lower ones, in becoming conduct. Botanical gardens, despite embodying these dispositions, still stood, stood slightly apart from their public park analogs since the main goal was to pursue scientific inquiries. Regardless, they were predisposed to raise awareness of nature so that the tastes of the public could be elevated and refined. The Missouri Botanical Garden held a central role in such reforming debates of mid to late 19th century America. In the decades prior to the American Civil War, Henry Shaw, a wealthy and respectable member of the St. Louis community who had amassed his fortune in the hardware trade, decided to turn his private estate into a garden for the public. Between 1840 and 1842, Shaw traveled extensively through the United States, Europe, and the Ottoman Empire, recounting his journeys in the fashion of 19th century diarists. In 1851, during his final trip abroad, Shaw spent time at the Great Exhibition in the Crystal Palace in London. This combined with trips to the woodlands and planted gardens of English estates, including Chatsworth, as well as the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, prompted Shaw to envision something similar for the vast tracts of land he owned in suburban St. Louis. The resulting Missouri Botanical Garden is a creation of Shaw and his advisors, including Dr. George Engelman, botanist and president of the St. Louis Academy of Sciences, Sir William Jackson Hooker, director of the Kew Royal Gardens, and Dr. Asa Gray, a leading botanist at Harvard University. The garden which opened to the public in 1859, same year as the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin uh, being published, comprised an arboretum, greenhouses, a museum, and other ancillary structures. Today, an eclectic set of interests forms the guiding principle behind the organization of the garden. Beginning with the Victorian garden, the botanical garden show, showcases historical landscaping and national gardening styles, rare and extraordinary specimens, and other features aiming to replicate the globe in microcosm. And this is a wonderful maze that they have in the um, Victorian section of the, the larger um, botanical garden. Upon his death in 1889, Shaw gifted the Botanical Garden and the adjacent Tower um, Grove Park to a trust headed by St. Louis citizens, instructing them to maintain it for all time for the public benefit. In a guide to the Missouri Botanical Garden, Shaw wrote the following, quote, of all public resorts, a scientific garden, when properly kept, will be found to be not only one of the most delightful mediums for intellectual gratification and amusement, but also one of the greatest of temporal blessings that can be enjoyed by a people. To all classes of society, a garden may be considered almost alike an object of interest, of instruction, and amusement." End quote. In tune with botanical garden missions elsewhere, the overt commitment in his statement to implant discernment of science and aesthetics was in service of civilizing the populace. As historian Carol, Gro Carol Grove puts it, botanizing combined physical exercise with the gathering of practical knowledge, promoted intellectual development by improving one's ability to observe and classify information, and enhanced mental discipline by improving memory and reasoning. 
Through an act of egalitarian benevolence, Shaw aimed to outfit the people of St. Louis and the greater United States with education alongside pleasurable diversion. As botany became increasingly fashionable, its appeal extended to the domain of women, something Shaw actively supported. The 19th century, a period marked by seismic political, technological, and cultural shifts, is when the domesticated landscape of the garden in its various forms became central to women's negotiations of private and public life. Botanical pursuits offered women a safe space to mingle with amateurs and professionals alike and to express accomplishments and dreams. Botanical gardens were seen as a refuge. Unlike public parks, they offered a walled or fenced off space safely removed from the commotion, filth, and moral corruption of the dense industrialized, industrialized metropolis. Middle-class visitors, particularly women, modeled and reinforced acceptable modes of public behavior in these protected public spaces. For Shaw, this underscored Botany's ability to promote gentility, refinement, respectability, and politeness, characteristics necessary for a cultivated life. Despite the stark differences in the purposes of Ottoman public gardens and American botanical gardens, these spaces shared similar concerns about moral order and teaching proper conduct by example. And I just wanted to show you um, a part of what used to be Tower Grove Park uh, was turned into the Shaw Nature Reserve. And so this is one of the walkways there. Um, and it's just beautiful to be able to sit on the bench and kind of look out. Um, and it just, it's a, it's a really lovely um, select section of the, the garden. <clears throat> As secular institutions, botanical gardens immersed in scientific inquiry, collection, conservation, and display have generally been recognized as museums with organized permanent acquisitions and a mission devoted to research and dissemination, didactic display and public engagement Botanical gardens are powerful symbols of social, economic, and political reform and stability. The United States Botanical Garden in Washington, D.C. was the very first of its kind and formed the basis of others to come. When the garden was still in conceptual form, Charles Wilson Peale, an American polymath, advised his esteemed colleague, a person you might know, Thomas Jefferson, your garden must be a museum to you. Nearly a century later, Dr. Nathaniel Lord Britton, co-founder of the New York Botanical Garden stated, botanical gardens are important factors in public education and are at the same time, places for public recreation and enjoyment. In effect, museums of living plants that illustrate not only the objects themselves, but their relation to other objects. Botanical gardens classification systems are on par with museums in categorizing works based on period, geography, climate, or species, and their aim is to combine empirical studies with broad educational content. It is no surprise then that botanical gardens encourage a ritual aspect while touring, not dissimilar to those enacted in art museums. Art historian Carol Duncan, tackling the legacy of museal discourse, has illuminated the ritualistic roles museums hold in disciplining mobility, comportment, and responsible engagement with art objects. As such, museums are considered politically charged, class conscious, and gendered repositories of the values of elite culture. Botanical gardens are equally constrained spaces. And as guide for the Missouri Botanical Garden, Henry Shaw established sets of rules based on those at Kew Gardens for visitors to enjoy the premises. The parallels with museum cautionary plaques demarcating decent demeanor are striking. Shaw's rules included no smoking, eating or drinking, no bringing of parcels, bags and baskets, wearing respectable attire, walking, not leaping or running and no touching of the plants. Most of these rules have not changed since Shaw's time and the general tenor regarding permissible activities remains. And this might be a little difficult to see, um, but here for the enjoyment of all in this little box are the rules um, for the current um, enjoyment of the gardens. And some of them are quite similar, no smoking and um, no um, eating or picnicking uh, over there. Also, while I have the map up on the screen, uh, so this is the entirety of the, the gardens. It's very, very large, um, but it's this little tiny space over here that forms the uh, Ottoman um, garden uh, in this little corner.
In practice, then, the constraints on the Bakewell Ottoman garden, aside from those specific to gender, imitate rules of Ottoman public gardens. An examination of the parallels and distinctions between the Bakewell Ottoman garden and its Ottoman forebears raises questions about the readability of these spaces when removed from their geographic and temporal home. In order to appreciate the full historical context of the garden, the lexicon of its cultural vocabulary must be accessible and easily graspable. However, for such resurrections, the extent to which a design vocabulary can be moved from one site to another, and the extent to which the meaning is changed or lost in the process, is the determinant for intelligibility. In explic explicating human dimensions of public spaces, <clears throat> Carr argues that the legibility of a space is dependent on the ability of its users to comprehend contextual cues. Cultural understanding requires conformity with elements that stimulate the senses to recognize resonance with normal patterns of life. In other words, the history of the Ottoman realm must be easy to recall and enough features within the Bakewell garden must correspond to that history for a visitor to intuitively arrive at its larger meaning. Taking the example of American city plazas, derivatives of Renaissance paradigms, Carr asserts that such public forums are largely irrelevant in American cities because the type of public and political, uh, sorry, type of public and political exchange conducted there in past centuries no longer takes place. Furthermore, in any human landscape interaction, new associations, meanings, experiences, and values are attached to and imposed upon the space as its historical symbolism recedes with time. People are shaped by the spaces they inhabit as much as they shape those spaces. <clears throat> In this regard, Bakewell Ottoman Garden carries a dual identity. Its location in the United States undoubtedly makes it part of American heritage, but its Ottoman roots require usage cues to make the space legible in its own accord. Despite its public label, the type of activities possible inside its walls cannot correspond to the normal leisurely practices in the customary manner of Ottoman public gardens. Might we do the Bakewell Garden better justice perhaps to read it as an Ottoman display garden in an American public space? My concern here has been to evaluate the multivalent notions of public space in Ottoman and American contexts through an examination of gardens and related public activities. These spaces force us to reassess how we think about Ottoman and American public spheres and demonstrate how simple translations are inadequate to convey, to convey complex gradations of form and meaning of spaces across cultures. Through social practices enacted in Ottoman and American public gardens, they became symbols of status within their own milieu. But as a transplanted and domestic foreign, domesticated foreign garden, the Bakel version reifies a civilizing and didactic rhetoric that is locally generated and executed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radha. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, just, just the whole idea of labeling something as public when it it would never have been a public garden in the Ottoman Empire. It would, the, the private gardens were very private, weren't they? they? You were very lucky to be able to go into them as a visitor. Um, perhaps I can put my question first, <laughs> but in there, which um, visitors seemed, visitors to Ottoman gardens seemed to be very struck by the kiosks or kiosks, I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, would, would people visiting Bakewell understand the, the pergola in that context or is there a guide to them to explain what, what that would be? Because it, obviously it's very dissimilar, dissimilar to, to a kiosk as such. Right, um, no, I mean, they've, they're, 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 uh, there are the audio guides, which you can take um, if you choose to, but um, I didn't really see many people actually walking in with the audio guides. Um, and so I don't know if there was, um, a clear understanding or that there is a general clear understanding of that space, what it means and how it looks or does not look different compared to the kiosk that you would find in, in, um, in Turkey. Um, but my impression is that it's one of those spaces where they sort of kind of go through 
and appreciate, you know, sort of in the abstract and then for itself walk out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have a question from some Stephen Radley. Um, why did the Missouri Botanical Gardens choose to construct an Ottoman garden as opposed to another style? Are Ottoman gardens distinct from gardens in the wider Islamic world? And if so, how and were the differences how and were the differences important to the creators of the Bakewell Ottoman Garden? That's a really good uh, uh, question there. Um, so the the Ottoman uh, garden in the Missouri Botanical Garden is uh, based on an endowment from the Bakewell family to the Missouri Botanical Garden. And part of that endowment was to uh, be able to construct something that would uh, appeal to their father's memory, um, who was very interested in Turkish gardens and Turkish culture. So that's where the connection comes in. Um, they had some really amazing people involved in the project. Um, they actually had a couple of art historians and architectural historians involved as well. Um, and so I imagine that in, in, in some of the conversations that I've had with people who were involved, it's very clear that um, uh, a lot of research went into the creation of this, this, this garden. Um, and I imagine that some of the um, criteria were related to how it would sort of fit into um, the, the, the notion of you know, accessible public space and how would that work? And so there is some kind of you know, compromise between the two, I, I, I think. But um, Ottoman gardens being different than other kinds of Islamic um, gardens, um, to some extent, yes. I mean, if you're looking at sort of the big imperial gardens, there are many similarities, um, the waterways, um, the kinds of you know, ways in which uh, the symmetry is achieved. But in general, Ottoman imperial gardens tended to be much more organic, um, less kind of landscaped, less sort of, you know, um, uh, made to conform to a particular style compared to the Persian and the Mughal ones in particular, where there is a lot more um, symmetry, there's a lot more emphasis on design, uh, geometry in particular. Um, and you see, see that coming up in those, those gardens. Um, Michael Gilson asks, um, I struggle to see what the botanical gardens want visitors to take away from the Bakewell. Has botanical education just become theme park experience? Um, it's, it, you know, it's interesting. Um, while I was there, there were a couple of uh, young children who were uh, blowing bubbles as they were walking through the garden. And um, on the throne uh, was uh, a, a cute little boy, you know, just sort of curled up and, and sleeping. Uh, and so it's interesting that in some ways, um, you know, you kind of have to really sort of be, want to, you, you'd have to be invested in order to, you know, go through this garden to look at the, um, the, the flora there to kind of really look at the different labels and get a sense of, you know, how this might be different compared to the Japanese and the Chinese, you know, companions of this garden. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, you know, it has become, I think, less about education and more about a place to go hang out. Um, and that's that's sort of the impression I got. But I don't want to, I don't want to diminish the fact that, you know, it, it's still it does retain, you know, uh, educational interest. I just don't know how uh, impactful it is, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, Michael Ann asks, asks um, do you think there is much knowledge about the Ottoman Empire amongst the visiting public? Um, I think the public who visit a Japanese garden do tend to know a bit about Japan, which... No, you're absolutely right. Um, I don't think that there is much knowledge about the the Ottomans, um, the Ottoman Empire in general, um, in the same way that there would be about um, Japan. And I think part of it is, um, I, I mean, you know, some simple things, you know, as in 
Japanese food. Um, if you go into like any sort of big American city, you know, you're going to find many restaurants are related to that, you know, all sorts of other kinds of cultural things that you can immerse yourself in when it comes to Japanese culture in the United States. Um, the same isn't true for, for Turkish culture in general and anything that, you know, is more specifically related to the Ottoman world. And so I don't believe that they come in to the garden with any kind of you know preconceived notion or any kind of um, information that they may already have. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was referring to the legibility of the garden. And in some ways, you're not going to be able to understand why these forms are present in the way that they're present, why they're next to each other. Um, like the 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 birdhouses, um, you know, they're they're so um, important when you look at Ottoman architecture. Uh, you see them on the outside of mosques and you see them in different spaces in the city. And I think it would be completely lost upon a person if they had no background whatsoever. Thank you. I suppose conversely, one could argue that if you see it, then you might become interested. I mean, you, you could take it, well, one would hope that people would say, well, that's really attractive. What does it mean? But that's, I suppose, the longer shot, isn't it? Um, and that's why, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, you carry on. No, I was just saying that that's why I think that, you know, instead of its emphasis on this idea of public, mm. um, uh, which, I, which I find very interesting, you know, that that, that has been emphasized um, in, its, um, in its marketing. Um, I, I think that, you know, thinking of it as a display garden, thinking of it as, you know, something akin to what would be in a museum, you know, if you're going to the Metropolitan Museum and you go into the Islamic art galleries, um, you see the Damascus room over there, you know, it's all been sort of set up and put together um, to look like a 19th century space from Damascus. Um, that is going to be visually tantalizing and it's going to be something that perhaps, you know, ignites that interest and makes people want to go and learn more about it. And I think that that probably is the, the real purpose here. Um, I'm just not sure if it's so effective in um, creating that kind of artificial dichotomy between public and private. Um, we have a question um, from Caitlin or a comment from Caitlin Murphy. Perhaps the experience can be become a path towards something new or culture less understood to echo my thoughts. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any any comments or questions to put to Rada before we sign off this evening? Any any going going on? <laughs> well, I think I think that's um, the whole issue of public. I, 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 you mentioned that some of the um, imperial gardens had been open to the public later on. It, how, did that, how did that actually work? I mean, this is, um, who funded it? How, how, is it, how did it happen? I, I've been to places like Yildiz and Ilamor, and clearly that's what has happened, but did it just, people just say, well, come in or what was the process? Because that that would give you a very different idea of what a public garden is. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, there's a, an amazing book uh, on it um, by Shireen Hamade, who discusses the 18th century uh, palaces and gardens. And it's around that time when you start seeing sort of, you know, these spaces being opened up. And they're the unused palaces, so they're not, you know, lived in by the, the royal family at the time, um, but they're just big, you know, vast tracts of land around the, um, the, the main buildings, and they're, they're opened up um, because there's sort of like this understanding, you know, developing at that time of an interest in creating these sort of public spaces. Um, and along with it, of course, you know, comes all of these this regulations um, to, to kind of control these spaces. And so there's a whole uh, uh, transition that takes place, and it's mostly in the late 18th century that you start seeing that happen, um, and then it picks up pace in the 19th century. And it's done by the, uh, you, you asked about the sponsorship, it's done by the, um, the, the uh, 
what at that point would have been the equivalent of the municipality of the um, the city, um, but it's coming from um, the 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 um, the the need to kind of revive those spaces or do something with them so that they don't become you know this decayed spots where other things more unsavory could you know uh, come about. I, I can't help commenting that they're probably more attractive than the, the one you showed outside the Dolma Bacha, which looked a little bit sparse, to be honest. It looks sort of quite rocky and <laughs> you know, I, not, not necessarily a destination for Sunday afternoon or Friday afternoon. <laughs> no, no, not exactly. There are a couple of other images that I had, but you know, we, we talked about that earlier. <laughs> so I had, I, I took them out. Right. Um, but yeah, no, definitely. Um, I have uh, two more questions. Um, sorry, Caitlin comes back. It occurred to me during Dr. Dallas' presentation that perhaps gardens, both private and public, were the first form of installation art, engaging all the senses and providing a personalized journey through curated space. Absolutely, I, I, I think that's very true. Um, I, I, I feel the way in which the gardens sort of engage the body um, and the way that we sort of move through and kind of, you know, uh, all our senses are activated. And, and I, I must say the time that I visited the Bakewell Garden, um, this was not in the winter, it was in, I think, springtime. Uh, it, it was, you know, the, 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 the smell, the sense, it was just really, really, really rich and lovely and kind of heady. And, yeah, definitely. There, it's it's. I think that there is a performative aspect to it, you know, as well in terms of um, the body and the space and the sort of um, negotiation between the two inside the the garden. So yeah. Okay. Um, Mg Jones asks, um, do we know the views of any Turkish visitors to the gardens? That's a good question, and I can't say I have a good answer for you. Um, I have not been able to, or I, I, I must admit that I haven't actually <laughs> looked for any information related to that, uh, but it's, it certainly would be interesting to, to hear um, their opinions and, and, and see what they think of it, for sure. Well, I think we've exhausted the question. So once more, a, a massive thank you. That was fascinating challenge to how, how I mean, even with a Chinese garden, you can't, it, it doesn't carry its meaning with it. it. It might carry the same structure, but it doesn't carry meaning. And it, it's a difficult thing to translate or transfer or what have you put, want to describe it from one place. And certainly in this case, one time to another. So a huge thank you. Um, our next talk uh, is not ne not in a fortnight's time, but in a month's time, when we'll be hearing Lian Ming talking about um, hydrology and the Jesuit Jesuit hydrology in the Chinese garden. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. <laughs>